So hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm really, really excited about this event. Uh, this event is a part of the Textile TV series, which is a New York Textile Month initiative uh, during the month of September. Please check out the rest of the New York Textile Month program. It is fantastic and available on the New York Textile Month website. My name is Laila Klinga, and I'll be joined today in conversation with Lily Homer and Elena Solomon, where we will be discussing Spaniel Arbet, its history, culture, relevance, and its context in contemporary craft and academic research. Today's event will not be in a lecture format, rather it will be a conversation between three young Jewish textile makers, artists, and researchers. We will have some time in the end to take some questions as well. You have a Q&A box. I think you can already put your questions in there for the end of the conversation. So I'll start by introducing myself briefly. I am Lala Klinger, as I mentioned. I'm a textile advocate, as well as a fiber artist and designer. I'm a graduate of the Parsons MFA Textiles Program here in New York City, hi from New York, and the Textile Design Department in Chicago College of Design and Engineering in Ramat Gan, which is in Israel, Palestine. I'm also an adjunct faculty member here at the MFA Textiles Program at Parsons School of Design, and I am a queer Jewish lace maker and a part of the fantastic Brooklyn Lace Guild. Hello to everyone from the Lace Guild who are joining us, hi. And I will hand it off to Elena and Lily to introduce themselves. So uh, Elena, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure, hi. <clears throat> hi, uh, I'm Elena Solomon. I'm an academic researcher based in Chicago. Uh, I just finished a master's from the University of Western Ontario um, titled The Embroidered Tablecloth about the effects of immigration on uh, Eastern European Jewish craft in the US in the past century. Uh, in my spare time, I also make art by suspending heavy metal objects with lace. And a lot of my focus is heritage lace reclamation. Great, thank you. Uh, Lily, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, hello. Hi, I'm Lily. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I'm a fiber artist. I work with embroidery and lace um, and crochet, and then also metalwork, welding, um, a lot of heavy, harder materials. Uh, I am a graduate of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago's MFA Fiber and Material Studies program. Um, I'm a very recent graduate, uh, so, and I also, part of that um, MFA in fine art was also doing a lot of research into one specific historical lace technique, which is the one that we're going to talk about today. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Great, thank you. Um, so I think the first question that we have to ask because I bet that most people in this conversation have never heard even of what is Spaniel Albert. So maybe if you'd like to define in your own words, what is Spaniel Albert? And as you are talking, I will pull up some images. I will say in advance to everyone, it is extremely hard to have images of them, so of these pieces. So they will be slightly pixelated, but I try to gather as many as possible. So you have some images. Um, so yes, Elena, Lily, if one of you wants to take it. I can begin, is that cool, Lena? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so Spania Arbet is a bob and lace technique. It, uh, it is the only known exclusively Ashkenazi Jewish lace technique. Uh, there's very little written about it. Um, the people who are writing about it are kind of spread out um, and seemingly disconnected. Uh, very few people still do this technique. Uh, we will get definitely into that a bit later, but it's it's very rare for this technique to still be made today. It's most popular uh, in the late 1800s around Eastern Galicia, Poland, Ukraine, Russia, that area. Um, and it's beautiful, as you can see. I mean, I think that's why I, I initially became so interested is just how gorgeous it is. Um, and we'll talk a bit about how it's made um, but in a, in a larger sense, it is bobbin lace, which means that um, strings usually, but in this case, um, metal tinsel and cotton um, and some other metallic threads are sort of wound around each other, almost crocheted together. They're attached to these bobbins, which are hung. And then so gravity is used in this equation. They're pinned into this um, surface design. Um, it's used in various uh, garments. Um, the prayer shawl, there's a, a neckline. Um, so that you know which direction the prayer shawl goes, and this decorates that. It's called an atara. Uh, we also have women's evidence of women's breastplates um, having this technique attached to it, uh, and and yarmulkes as well. Um, 
and a couple other seeming more, seemingly more secular um, pieces of attire, which seemed less common, but uh, it still happened. Um, Elena, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think that mostly covers it. Uh, this, I think we're researching this not as like a romanticization of the of a lost art or anything. I think that we're curious in to record the history of this particular craft um, while understanding that craft changes over time. Uh, and especially as a diasporic people, um, it, the craft will change as we're moving. And so it's not relevant now um, as much and it was at the time. And so we were just curious what's going on. Did Lila freeze? You can keep chatting. Sure. Layla comes back. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we, Elena and I sort of came across Spenier Arbit on, in separate ways um, and we got in touch only about a year ago, um, maybe less, I think less than a year ago. Um, and we kind of realized that we're both interested in this technique, but there's so little information about it. And we've sort of been researching together and trying to um, collect and build a documentation on it. And now we'll be writing um, the encyclopedia entry for the Bloomsbury Encyclopedia of World Textiles, uh, which will hopefully be coming out in 2022. Uh, and so this larger project also is now leading towards us writing, sort of um, attempting to collect enough information to have a sort of a reference point for people to be able to go to to learn about this technique. Ayla, are you back? I am. I feel that uh, my laptop could not handle the beauty of Spaniel Albert, so decided to crash suddenly. If you could, um, any of you, remake me as a host, I will show my face as well and also continue sharing some images. And yes. I'm very sorry for the technological failure. I'm trying to figure out how to do it. If you do the three dots by mm -hmm. my name. I'm getting change rule to attendee. So I was assuming you're already a host. I don't have the option. Mm. Odd. Okay, maybe I will just be a floating figure. That can also be a thing. I think the New York textile account month is it is the host. And I think she can let you be the host. Okay, well. Anyway. Hmm. Strange. Okay, I just made Layla a panelist. I hope that works. Oh, she's the host. Okay. Hello, I'm back, everyone. Hi, <laughs> thank you for your patience. <laughs> Again, Spaniel is so mysterious that it has to have some, you know, it's trying to protect its, itself, apparently. Um, yeah, so thank you, Elena and Lily. I caught the beginning and the end of it. We're talking about, about Spaniel. I will share a few more of the images if it will let me because I do think they're quite nice. Um, and I think everyone likes a visual as well. So let's see if it will allow it now. I think it should be okay. And as, let's see that it's loading, yes. Okay, as we are viewing these lovely artifacts of Spania. Um, I would love it if maybe Lily, you can tell us what drew you to start researching this, this specific craft. So maybe I will also say that the way I was introduced to Lily is through an article or essay, actually I should say, that you had in conversation with another person that was posted on Protocols, which is a great magazine, you might say. Um, talking about trying to find Spaniel Albert, like trying to find all the leads for it. And through that, I connected with Lily and also Elena and Lily connected. Um, so I would love if you could talk about what drew you to it and trying to chase that loose, loose little bit of yarn, if we might do a textile pun. Sure. Yeah. So I got my undergraduate degree in architecture and I was working on my thesis and I started crocheting with steel wire. I was attempting to 
see if a fiber could uh, sustain itself and create um, a freestanding structure. And then I graduated and I started working at a, needle, a needlework school and reading more about historical techniques. Um, and I got a book called The Art of Judaic Needlework by Ita Aber. And I think on the very first page, she mentions this technique because it's exclusive to Ashkenazi Jews, which is so rare. And there was an image and it was so beautiful uh, that I decided to look it up, as I mentioned, found very little information about it and just decided from then, which was 2017, from then on, I, I've just been digging. And it sort of led me down different paths. Um, most of them are pretty conceptual because I apply ideas about Spanier Arbed and sort of its, um, its opacity, my inability to learn about it, um, sort of the walls that I've hit in research, uh, those sort of find themselves materializing in my artwork in ways that sometimes seem um, tangential, but it all connects back to um, this through line of Spanier Arbet. And yeah, I had that interview uh, with a good friend of mine, Jacob Carlin, who I believe is, uh, is watching now. And that, and that was really exciting for me because a big part of this project for me is to connect with other people who might be interested in this, you know, who might be interested in Ashkenazi Jewish culture um, that because there isn't a whole lot that's unique to our culture. Um, so much is shared and that's so beautiful, um, but it, it feels particularly exciting for me to be able to learn more about this technique um, because it feels, um, it feels important. And uh, Elena reached out to me after having read that article and we connected and yeah. And from then on, we've uh, been, we've been hunting together. So yeah. Great, thank you. Elena, would you like to say how you stumbled upon Spania and what drew you to it? Sure, so uh, I think I stumbled upon it when I was applying to grad school. Um, and you and I spoke about this, we had a similar experience where I was specifically Googling Jewish textiles uh, to hone my focus for the, um, for the application. And only then did this come up because I had been researching textiles for a long time. Um, and I'm, I've been doing, uh, I've been having like an involvement with Jewish textiles and Jewish other things for a long time, but I've never seen this until I searched those two things together. Uh, and then I found out about it and immediately wanted to try to make it myself and discovered that this is not something that people know how and, and people um, can teach me. Like there's only five people in the world, I think, who still make it. Uh, they're not really sharing the information at the moment. So we're a friend of mine um, who I think is in the talk sent the protocols articles featuring Lily uh, and her exploration with Spiner Arbit and I had to message her. Um, and I actually really, I messaged her for, she talked about this journal that her great grandmother had about immigrating to Chicago. Um, and because I wanted to use it in my thesis. Uh, and so I reached out to her for that first, I think, and, and also about the Spiner Arbit. And she, her family ended up letting me use it in the thesis. And now we're also um, writing this article together. So it, it worked out. Yeah, that's really exciting. I'm really glad also how Spania creates these connections and trying to chase this sort of ghost of our heritage as well. Um, I would also share that I was, as a textile maker and researcher, I was looking to see if there is any kind of specific um, textile to Jewish production and Jewish consumption, because I haven't heard of anything like it. And I reached out to an old professor of mine and she sent me this one article she wrote in the 90s about Spanier Arbeit. I was like, maybe this will be of interest to you. And after that, my mind was blown because I think um, as the diaspora people who are also constantly moving throughout history, we think of our history as we don't have any textile crafts that are specific to us. And as far as we know, we don't necessarily. And then to find out this kind of um, craft. And not only that, to me, one of the things that's fascinating about it, as we can see through some of the images, that when we think about Jewish textiles, often we think about religious textiles or textiles for religious purposes for men, right? Mm -hmm. um, and with Spanien Albert, we have mixed use in a way, which is really, really fascinating. Um, so we have both for men and for women. So we have definitely things that are like the atarot, the things for the tlet, for the pirishal, uh, if we'll say this in the non-Jewish version of it. Um, but we also have the bothuch, 
which is sort of a breastplate for women, which as far as I know, and I'm pretty sure about that, does not serve any religious purpose, right? Um, so it's very mysterious in its origins. So I would love to hear a bit more. I will stop sharing the images. Maybe we'll go back to them, who knows? Um, but I will gladly, to anyone who's listening, who's interested in finding these images, because it's really quite hard to find example, visual examples of Spania, I will be very happy to send you uh, what we have so far. I think one of the things that's really interesting in trying to research Spania is how hard it is and how secretive it is. And if you would like to talk maybe about the challenges you've had so far in trying to go about researching it and what have you done and what do you know is done so far? Um, if Elena, you want to take that question. Uh, sure, so there's, I think that there was a wave of interest in the 80s, maybe the 70s and 80s, there were a couple of researchers that um, came to the field and started writing these articles. And they're all retired now. Um, and they're, you know, the, the interest kind of went down. Um, and there has not been much focus on it until now. And I think right now, interest is picking back up. There's a resurgence in focus on Yiddish as well, especially in the diaspora, uh, and an exploration of um, Ashkenazi heritage, and this can extends out to the Spanier Arbit. Uh, and so for now, we have like a limited number of articles with some information uh, and then some, you know, big gaps that we're trying to figure out if we can fill. Um, so do you want me to cover that now, some of the history? Uh, sure. I think that would be great. And Lily, feel free to also chime in as you have input. Okay, so, so there's like a specific myth about the origin, like where did it come from? And the, the same myth appears in um, several articles and it goes like this. This man, Mordechai Leib Margulis, um, and I'm, I might be mispronouncing his last name. He escaped the hoppers, the, the Russian hoppers, the kidnappers who would kidnap people and um, conscript them for 25 years of service in the, in the Russian army. And so, I guess they were they were hunting him and he escaped and he appears in a town called Sasov and this is in Galicia, uh, which and Sasov is in modern day Ukraine and this story takes place in modern day Ukraine but I think there were, it takes place like right across the border so there was Russia controlled area and then there was the outside of Russia um, all of this was in an area called Galicia and so Mordechai shows up in Sasov and he, all he has, he's 16 and it's 1830. And all he has in his pocket are, is some metal thread from his father's workshop. And he sets up the loom. Um, I don't know if we saw a picture of it, um, but it- will share the loom as well as you're okay. talking. Yeah, so he sets it up like almost overnight and he, he starts the weaving or the, the lace making. Um, and then he makes the first um, Atara in Sasov and you know, it jumped off from there. So he ended up having um, a, a big company and he was sneaking in this, the metal thread. Um, no one knew where he was getting it. And so he like gained this monopoly over the market for 30 years. Um, but the story is a little bit weird because why would an entire lace technique start with one guy? Um, and also when he shows up, he already has the metal thread in his pocket and he already seems to know how to make it. It doesn't seem like he invented it. So like within the origin story is another origin, like in the, in the background, right? So I looked up because several articles, um, Giza Frankel cites this, this story in detail. Um, and then Bonnie Dara Michaels, who works at Yeshiva University, like she says, it is believed to have first appeared in Poland in the 1700s. Um, and Ita Aber also mentions, so Giza Frankel and Ita Aber both mentioned the towns um, Berdichev and Radzivel, uh, which were two like centers, I suppose. Berdichev, I didn't find anything, um, but Ita Aber cites, and this is part of the myth that Spanier Arbit transfer translates in English to both Spanish work and spun work, it's the same word. And so the, the myth is like that this um, technique came out of Spain from the Inquisition, but it doesn't really follow. Um, so supposedly, according to Isa Aber, Berdyshev and Radjavel were towns that, um, 
I, I can write them down in a second. Uh, they That's were okay. towns, yeah, that that supposedly that people were going to after the Inquisition that they were there, um, but people were going to when they left Spain, they went to Italy, England, Holland, Morocco, Egypt, France, the Americas, but they weren't going to Eastern Europe. And there's no evidence that Jews appeared in Berdyshev until 1721. Um, so it, it seems like this, and you know, in, in addition that this is a bob and lace technique, which um, originated also in Eastern Europe. So it really seems like this isn't uh, a Spanish technique, that this is just spun work. So um, to, set, to set the scene a little bit, there's the town Berdyshev, which is in modern day Ukraine. Um, Jews, it, it, it was like this big center. So it was the center of Jewish life in the pale in the 1700s and the early 1800s. Um, Mendela Mocher Sforim and Sholem Aleichem based their um, towns on Berdyshev, which is really interesting. Like this is, we have this uh, idea of what the shtetl is. Um, which is proven to be like sort of a myth that developed later on in history. Uh, but those authors were big um, in influencing our understanding of our, our memory, I think, of the shtetl. And they based the shtetl on this town, Berdyshev. So there was also a number of other things. Um, the Haskalah, the, the Jewish Enlightenment, was, there was, Berdyshev was a big center for that. Um, Volhynian Hasidism was rooted there and it was also a big center for the Bund. Uh, which was a, uh, an organization for the radical left in uh, in Europe. And it was also um, a center of trade for a number of trades, including tailoring and cloth in general. And what's more, I also found that there was a monopoly of the cloth trade that was given to seven Jewish merchants by a Prince Rajavel. And I did not find a town called Rajavel, but I did find someone named Prince Rajavel who, and this may have been like where the information is coming from. So to set the scene, like this very Ashkenazi town with like all of these historically majorly influential activities happening in Berdyshev, Mordechai came from there. Mordechai laid Margulies, which started this whole thing, supposedly came from there, which means probably that Shvanir Arbit um, has its roots in Berdyshev and possibly some other towns. And That's so he gets, really yeah, he escapes and he comes over there. Um, yeah, super fascinating. So it seems like there, there's a lot of context um, happening here. And Lily, if you wanna um, add anything. Yeah, I'm thinking about just what he did when he began the trade there. He opened up a workshop and the reading about it is kind of funny because it never got that big. I mean, you know, in modern day standards. Uh, so articles will say he employed tens of workers uh, at its very height, you know, so that could mean 20, 30 people at its, you know, at its highest point of production. And I, I think some of it has to do with, it takes a long time to get trained. Um, the materials are very expensive. Um, there's a limited amount of people ordering it um, because it's so expensive. Um, you know, he had to sneak in materials from other countries for a while, uh, which made it pretty rare. Um, for a while, only men were hired to do this work, um, and it was sort of made for an, ex an exclusive customer base. And um, yeah, it, it, it sort of gained popularity. They eventually had to hire the wives of the men working there so that they could fill orders. And uh, yeah, and that's sort of, that's the origin story for me is like, um, sort of this tension in my head between trying to, I'm trying to understand whether this technique is a religious technique, um, is for garments for prayer, um, like the talus, um, like the yarmulke, and yet also seeing so many examples, particularly at the peak of its production, uh, in garments that potentially have nothing to do uh, with worship. Um, and, and yet also knowing that these were made exclusively by Ashkenazi Jews and the vast majority of the customer base were also Jews, although there are examples of it being sold um, to non-Jewish Europeans and I believe people in North America as well. Yeah, I think that is one of the really interesting things about it, that it was at some point quite popular as far as we know from the text, but also from examples that we still have. One of the really hard thing about doing Ashkenazi Jewish uh, scholarship or research is that, uh, at least for materials that is, or material culture, is that you don't have a lot of material culture left because of the Holocaust. Uh, 
random pogroms, et cetera, et cetera. It was not easy for Jews in Eastern Europe throughout. Um, and especially after World War II, you really don't have that many artifacts left. And actually a bunch of the images um, that I was showing were specifically from items retrieved after being looted by Nazis, Germans, et cetera, et cetera, uh, during the World War, uh, Second World War. And because it was actually produced enough by the looks of it, at least, because we don't have any inventories, it made its way to Western Europe and the Americas during the 19th century, which is why, which is why we have relatively a lot of artifacts. And so we don't have that many, but relatively we have a lot, um, which is really incredible in that sense. But we still, the origin story is so unclear and it's fascinating what you're saying, Elena, this connection with the Bund and also the Escala and lace making. Uh, amazing, who thought? I think- And the, and the really Hasidic good. movement also, which is and the Hasidic separate, movement. right? And they're, they're all happening in this one town, mm -hmm. which by the way, ended up, they got, um, taken over by the Nazis in 41. And then they, you know, people were killed off in large numbers, like in six months and eight months, they were ghettoized, you know, the whole thing. And so, yeah, we, we definitely lost a lot of, of uh, information there. But it, it's interesting because I think in the story, what I was reading from Pisa Frankel, he was, it says that he was smuggling in the thread from his hometown in Russia. And like all, elsewhere in the story, it mentions that he's from Berdyshev, so I think that what happens, what happened is in order to escape the hoppers, he had to cross the border. And so Sasov must have been over the border, but close. And he was like smuggling it in, in the, you know, carts that were crossing the border with other goods. And then eventually he started getting it from Germany, which was also another big source of thread production, especially within the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. I could keep going for a while. Yeah, no, it's, it's fantastic. I'm personally really, really enjoying it. Um, I hope others are as well, but I bet. Um, yeah, it's, I think one of the really interesting things about it is that we have so little information. It's constantly, I heard from this person that this person told them that they read in this article and it's this constant myth uh, that is linked to Spaniel Albert, both to the making of it, but also to the origins and the history and the context of it. So we know very little from all angles, truly, because even if we talk about the physical making of it, and maybe Lily, um, as you were trying to learn how to make Spaniel, maybe you can talk a bit about from your understanding, how is it even made? Because it is, as we can see the jig here, which there are still a few surviving. I think this one is, it's not the one in the Betel Tzot Museum in Israel. This one is from um, the Lvov uh, Craft Museum, if I'm not mistaken, Ethnographic Museum, sorry. I know they do have one there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this one is from there. Um, but as we mentioned, there are about five people. I know of two. Um, supposedly there are three more anonymous ones that know how to actually work Spaniel a little bit and they protect the secret very heavily. Um, and even to this day, people who are scholars of this managed to reconstruct the jig and kind of make it, but not really. Um, and it is bobbin lace, but as you can see, the bobbins are hanging on this, basically, um, treadles. So if you want to maybe talk about the technical aspect of it, from your understanding of how potentially it is made, because again, no one exactly knows. Yeah, very few people know, uh, and part of our more recent research has been trying to connect um, with the people who do know, um, and they're, you know, they're secretive, privative, rightfully so, and we definitely do not know all of the people uh, who know how to do it. I don't think, you know, I think if somebody learned how to do it in 1930, uh, and they're in an old age and they're still doing it, they're not necessarily also blogging about it or creating YouTube videos or answering emails. You know, so I think, you know, crafts that are passed down word of mouth or written down um, in a book that's only shared with family members, they're particularly hard um, to sort of suss out information. And so uh, a bit of what I've been doing, so the Spurtis Museum in Chicago has a couple samples um, and you can make an appointment and see them. Um, they're, they're just gorgeous. Uh, and if this is the kind of thing you have to do if you want to see the pieces, they're usually not on display at different museums. You know, you can figure out if they have a piece, make an appointment um, and go in. And they also have to be protected from light because they oxidize, they're made of metals. You know, if people touch them, it's, you know, they, they decompose. Um, 
So after looking at a couple pieces in person, also at the Yeshiva M University Museum in New York uh, in person and taking photos, I tried to, uh, like Lila said, some people try to sort of, you know, reverse engineer. Uh, and I did do that a bit. Um, but there are aspects of it that I would really just need to sit down with someone who, who knows how to do it. And I think that's kind of part of why it's so exciting to me. Like I, I really could never figure this out on my own uh, just from photos or just from looking at the lace. You know, I think if I were to buy a piece uh, which you can still buy them online um, by people, by the few people who are still making them, you know, I could take it apart and, you know, try to remake it myself, but that seems, you know, I would never want to deconstruct one of the very few pieces that exist. Uh, and I also would love to sit down uh, with somebody who, who does know it. So um, part of that journey is just trying to make something that feels uh, close to it by doing similar work, which is, you know, wrapping, crocheting um, with metal, building up a surface area, building something that feels strong. That would be, um, and part of what I love so much about Spanier Arbit is there's, I think there's at least four, I believe there are seven different uh, threads, uh, which is an important number um, in, um, uh, in some sects of Judaism, seven is important. Uh, so there are seven, I believe it's like three metallic strands and four cotton strands, and they're all weaving together. And so there's potentially thousands of feet of fibers wound around these bobbins, which are then set up and pinned um, onto this, cylindrical pillow somebody an expert had already drawn the design on it sometimes this is a separate job uh, and then these bobbins you know they start working together and they start twisting and these thousands of feet of fibers start coming together and becoming tighter and stronger and it ends up in this small surface area relative you know to the length of the original fibers and i think this sort of hiding of material this wrapping, constricting, um, concealing is a word that I think is, is relevant uh, of the technique itself. I then think that that type of work has implications for then uh, how it's been shared through time. Um, it's been you know tightly wound um, in a small community, um, concealed for various reasons, you know, some religious, um, I think some of it is just that it's a lucrative trade. Um, and so, you know, if you have, uh, a skill that's really highly valued, uh, you know, I don't think that it's very common to just give that information away to a stranger online. Um, so I, I thought maybe this is a good time to share some images. Uh, I've just pulled up my website of just some relevant. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, cool. um, let's see. Yeah, while you're pulling that up, Lily, I yeah. love what you did with it because it, it just feels like it mirrors the the search that people have the relationship that the Jewish people have had Ashkenazi Jews with Yiddish mm -hmm. um because like a lot of our parents grew up and they said oh I took Yiddish I took German in school to try to understand my parents speaking Yiddish and it was like this reverse engineering because there were no schools to go to to teach Yiddish a lot of the um grandparents and great-grandparents refused to speak it at home so that the kids would assimilate um, and so, you know, there was this sort of idea that if you spoke German, then you would get to Yiddish because Yiddish is just Hebrew plus German. And it's not, it's, it's a whole other language and it can't be understood if you just take German. And it's the same with a Spanier Arbit. Like you cannot just understand it if you only learn Babin Lays, except that we can't access the, the knowledge here. So it really feels connected what you're doing. Yeah, I, and I love the connection, and we've talked about this a little bit together, but the connection between Spanier Arbit and Yiddish, uh, and it made me realize why I feel passionately about both of these ideas, and it may be for the same reason. Uh, so let's see. Okay, I brought up just some fiber. So my fiber-based work uh, in the last, I would say, five years, there's this through line of Spanier Arbit. The most relevant work um, is was... The, one of them was an image for the talk today. It's called spiraling. So I learned how to do a very basic style of Russian bobbin lace online um, on YouTube actually. Um, and it's just basically a full stitch. And I just did that basic full stitch um, many times uh, and created this sort of uh, wound spiraling 
object. And also because it's wire, why I love working with wire so much is that it has memory in it. So it can hold its own shape. So, you know, when I let some of the, the wound bits go, it, it holds the spiral. Uh, and then also um, I left on the bobbins. Um, it certainly is a work in progress. And I think that that shows. And I also, um, I think part of what's interesting is that this story is still ongoing uh, because it's not, it's not a technique that's widely documented and you can access it anywhere. And we have all the loose ends tied up. There are so many questions. I mean, literally even the name of it, you know, still has question marks around it. Uh, so sort of that, that ongoing project, I think is really important conceptually. Um, and then this one, this one, this is a, a series of two pieces that I called Shatuf, which is community uh, in Hebrew. And this was when I was trying to work large scale uh, to think through the techniques that I was seeing in images of Spanier Arbit and a little that I could read about how it's made. So, um, you know, there's braiding involved, there's wrapping metal around cotton. So I got some cotton burlap um, and some just a jeweler's wire um, and wound them together. And then, you know, then try to construct a service area, uh, which is what's happening in Spanier Arbit. So this is, you know, it's experimentation, but a lot of the, the physical parts of it that I find important conceptually, that is what I tried to translate into these works. Um, yeah, those are, I think, the clearest versions. Uh, this one uh, called Squiggle um, is basically just that aspect of concealing material, taking one long line of wire, which is what I did, um, wrapping it around my fingers and then twisting them into figure eights is uh, a way for me to create a recognizable shape and also uh, uh, constrict a lot of material into a small area uh, where to the point where you can't tell how much is being used. Um, so yeah, I think I'll stop now and we can go back to Spanier Arbit. No, I think it's all, you know, this is a conversation. I think it's really interesting to see what is Spanier Arbit, but also how it informs contemporary Jewish craft practice, um, which actually is a really good segue to my next uh, question to the both of you. So I saw this in the comments as well, like some people in the chat were asking, why are all of these people so secretive about it? Um, so to anyone who doesn't necessarily know, for the most part, as far as we know, the people who are making Spanish Albert now are men, Jewish men, Orthodox, devout, practicing Jewish men, probably from a specific also Hasidic dynasty. I'm not 100% sure if they're all from the same uh, dynasty, but generally, they're not necessarily people who would look like us, let's put it that way, and not necessarily from the same community. Um, and I think that brings a lot of questions and seeing how this was, for the most part, as far as we know, practiced by Hasidic or not, we are not fully, fully aware, but it looks by the looks of it, by what we know so far, practiced by Hasidic people in Eastern Europe. What does it mean to be nowadays um, at the 21st century, uh, a Jewish woman person who's not necessarily a devout Orthodox man practicing it when it's not your direct heritage, but it does feel like your heritage at the same time being Ashkenazi Jews. Um, if Elena, you want to start by thinking how it relates to you and how do you approach this question? Sure, yeah, I mean, I think it's complicated. Um for both of us in, in different ways. You know, I think one of the reasons that it's secretive is because it is it is spiritual, it's considered a spiritual um, craft and it's done for spiritual purposes and it's within the community. And so I think there's been a lot of different opinions about how we practice Judaism and who's allowed to do what um, within the culture. Uh, and so, you know, and, and there's this other tension that we experience, and, and th uh, there's a lot of parallels between reclaiming an attempt to reclaim Spanier Arbit and the reclamation of Yiddish, Yiddish which is going on um, now as well. Because uh, one of the costs of assimilation or um, moving and, you know, blending in in the diaspora, especially in the US uh, and, the, and Canada, is um, that people had a choice to make. You know, you could either choose 
to blend in um, and have much higher probably um, economic success, um, or you could choose to maintain culture and people ended up self-isolating a little bit um, and not, you know, they, they kept the clothing and the language, which were the main symbols of um, our culture. And so people went in different directions. They had a choice to make, and now we're all here. And we, you know, who has claim to the history, right? Is it just one of us or is it everyone? Um, but, you know, because, and the parallel here with Yiddish is that um, there is a small community on the left that maintained Yiddish um, as a language at home since, you know, since immigrating here from the, from Eastern Europe. And a lot of the community didn't um, except the Orthodox. So there's this people on the on the far left, which is a much smaller community, and the Orthodox community, which is a much bigger community, who maintain Yiddish. And now all of a sudden, these people, um, a lot of whom are on the left, are sort of running to the Orthodox in like sometimes uncomfortable ways because they have the the knowledge that we're suddenly seeking. And so I think there's some tension there uh, because the Orthodox um, community has done a lot of work to preserve. The language and also with um, Spanier Arbit, those who did preserve it. And I think a lot of people, even within the Orthodox community, which is, of course, massive and not a unified group at, at all, um, a lot of people didn't don't use it or didn't preserve it. And so there was like a very few, few people who did the work to preserve it. And so to suddenly let it go, um, especially to people who might not be using it in a spiritual way, is perhaps a choice. And that's all I can say. I mean, I, I don't know their reasoning, honestly. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's a matter of whose, it, it is our heritage. Um, and we also have to respect all of the work that was done for the preservation over all these years and, and respect that we've gone in different directions um, and, and just that there's a gap. And, and, you know, we have to just acknowledge that, I think, tread mm -hmm. carefully. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I agree with everything Elena said. And I think the question of you know whose heritage is it is it's complex it's it's also particularly complex i think um for jews we've been talking about an ashkenazi jewish technique um you know which which is an ethnic group within judaism but judaism is so so much larger than that i mean maghrebi jews and mizrahi jews and Sephardic jews and jews of color and jews by conversion every you know there 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 are traditions that come down from different lineages um that I don't necessarily consider part of my direct heritage, but we're all under this larger umbrella. Um, and I think that sharing that information is part of what makes the religion so exciting and so colorful and so wonderful. Uh, it's part of why I was so excited when Elena reached out to me. It was like, the, you know, this is the goal is for me is to bring in people who just want to learn about a craft um, that looks beautiful uh, and is, you know, maybe it's not directly part of my lineage and it, honestly it, it might be it's impossible to know you know these areas that it came from are where my ancestors came from um and i have no idea what they were doing there so um and and also as we've said because so few people do it and also so few people in the orthodox community do it that feels to me like uh, there is some movement uh some some space in there for me to ask questions uh you know we've asked Orthodox Jews from different countries, uh, if they've ever heard of it, and most people haven't, you know, Jewish textile artists uh, from major museums have not heard of this technique. So that to me feels like there's, there is plenty of room for me as a researcher, and also as a Jewish woman to be curious, you know, at the very least. Uh, and I think in a larger sense, this is where this conversation can connect pretty easily uh, with diasporic communities uh, from around the world. Uh, and also, essentially, if you're, you know, if you're a descendant from any culture, that it, it gets muddled in some way, and you may become interested in, uh, you know, something your grandfather was doing, uh, you know, in a different country. And just because there was this movement, suddenly there feels like there's this barrier. Um, maybe it's not stated as clearly as in the example that we're talking about. Uh, but I do think most people have had this experience where they want access to this information. They don't know, uh, you know, what the protocol is, but they know that it's it should be shared. Um, I think is where I come down um, in the end, and I think like this is where this conversation gets really interesting, and where I feel I've had the most um, the most fruitful conversations with people who are not Jewish, um, who can very much relate to this feeling. Yeah, I completely agree with uh, the both of you. It's 
it feels uh, like a very complex ground to tread into, but at the same time, a ground that you really want and is really compelling um, and does feel that is related to you. I think that for me as a Jewish person, when I see these artifacts, a lot of them, even if they're not something that I necessarily saw growing up at the synagogue, I can recognize them as Jewish artifacts. And the same way that I can recognize uh, a set of the Chichim of Death Shrouds that are from Northern Africa for um, Maghrebi Jews, even if it's not directly, directly my heritage, I can recognize it because largely it is my culture. And especially being Ashkenazi, all three of us, and I know at least for my family history, they all live pretty much around that area. Who knows? And spoke Yiddish at the same time. Um, so I think the connection, especially since the name of this craft is in Yiddish, I think it's really a fascinating connection to make um, how this craft is nowadays in the same way of how Yiddish is and our approach to it being kind of similar in a way. And also feeling, for me at least, a very similar relationship as my grandparents on one side spoke Yiddish, on the other, at some point they spoke Yiddish as well, uh, although they were not religious, whatever that means, but they were just Jewish. Um, and as this craft is ultimately, is it sacred to some degree? Yes. To another, I'm not sure. It looks like it was also just about beauty at the end of the day, because it is so beautiful and decorative. Um, so it has some aspects of showing off how religious you are, but also just how beautiful you can be and how beautiful Jewish crafts can be at the same time and secretive and protect them. Um, there's also just like how how um, how it developed to be part of the prayer shawl is interesting and is also contested. You know, like some Orthodox sects didn't want that embellishment attached and don't do that. Um, and then some do in a different interpretation of the Talmud think that there should be some sort of decoration, distinguish the bottom of the prayer shawl from the top. Uh, and then go a step further and make it this incredibly lavish, um, beautiful attachment. So even you know within within the Hasidic community, there are in, in, you know a huge variety of interpretations of of what's appropriate um, and what's worth preserving uh, and what garments to wear and you know what's religious and what's not. So um, like you say, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think we're getting close to six. So I will ask you a final question and then uh, we will take, I see we have some questions in the Q&A box. Uh, but before that, I would like to ask you, where do you see yourself uh, going with the research of Spaniel Albert? Where would you like it to see it going? Um, yeah, that is the question. So if Elena, especially I was uh, recently started to read your thesis, which was maybe you can say also a few words in that because it is fascinating. And I bet there are some people who would love a link to it after you talk about it a bit. If you can talk about it a bit and maybe if you see a relationship to Spanish a bit in the future in your uh, academic research. Um, sure, so I will keep this very short. Uh, talking about my thesis. But um, I think the, the relevant point of the research that I uncovered in the past year for the thesis um, is primarily that Jewish craft is local. Um, and I was research researching specifically Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern European crafts as they transitioned to US through the migration. Um, and I think that we saw a change, people were making, um, the craft was almost entirely indistinguishable from Romania if they were living in Romania, Ukraine if they were living in Ukraine, um, unless the, you know, with the exclusions of, of embroidery, for example, in Romania that was specifically religious uh, in, in the Christian community, um, which Jews were not making. But otherwise, you know, there was a massive overlap. And then the, you saw the craft change pretty quickly upon entrance into the United States. Um, and, it, and it followed the social trends of whatever was happening in the U.S., and so I think this connects back to the Spanier Arbit as to one of the reasons why um, it fell out of fashion among probably many others. Um, and, you know, and just why people maybe aren't making it now um, because they are focused on, on making what's here as opposed to preserving a tradition um, culturally that came down from our parents or grandparents, which is actually what I thought uh, would have been what was going on, but but it wasn't what was happening. People were really learning outside the home and then bringing that back. Each generation was doing that. Um, so where where can we take this in the future? 
Um, as a crafter myself, I mean, really one day I would love to make Spanier Arbit. Um, I think that's that's been a goal of mine for a while and I'm sure this is a, a very long-term goal because I think it's gonna be hard to learn. Um, and then in terms of academic research, I'd love to get a, a clearer history. Um, and you know, this the Spanier Arbit is really such a blip in the history of Ashkenazi Judaism. You know, it, it was popular and I mean, at a generous estimate, like 1700s up until the early 1900s. And so it's it's really not central to Jewish um, materials. Like it, it's not requirement in any way. It's just like a beautiful lace that happened at a specific period in time. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to document the history and I'd like to see how it um, related to where people were living again, like the research of how craft was locally influenced um, and to make uh, larger connections from there. All right, thank you. Uh, Lily, what about you? Yeah, I think similar to Elena, I, also Elena's thesis is awesome. Uh, definitely read that when we link it. Um, yeah, I think sort of a theory of mine that I'd really like to gather evidence for and then through that process, maybe learn other techniques as well is I, I have this theory that crafts that emerge from certain places reflect visually the circumstances under which they were created. Um, you know, subconsciously the maker, you know, yeah, translating uh, their daily experiences into the work, especially while the work is being developed as a, as a new technique. Um, you know, this could be very literal, like with imagery, you know, carved into a pot, you know, you know they'll, you know, carve what they see, but, uh, and, you know, take that and extrapolate it to something that's a lot less, uh, a lot less easy to see a direct link. I want to be able to materialize those links. So, so like my theory with Spanier Arbit being wound and wound and concealed, um, translating to a culture that I've always found growing up to have so much concealment involved. Um, and yeah, I, I think I'd like to, to start drawing more of those links. Uh, just like Elena, I would love to learn it. I think that's, that's not my primary goal. Uh, I feel like at this point I have, I've made so many connections through this research um, and, you know, growing my, my Jewish community uh, and connecting with people who are interested in this kind of thing um, culturally, you know, in terms of heritage, I think would be great. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's definitely about more than the Spanier Arbit to me and also uh, allowing it to continue to influence my art practice is where I'd like to see it go. Great, uh, thank you both of you so, so much. I feel that this for me, for the people in the crowd, I will also say this is something that I wouldn't say historic, but this doesn't really happen that often that people come together to talk about Spanish, especially young people. I feel like we're definitely at a really interesting point of um, renewed interest in this. And for me, at least it's been a delight and I hope for other people as well. And we have a few questions. So let's see what we have and we can take them. Okay. Um, so let's see. Okay, so the question we have here from Jasmine is, is Spanish a little bit unique in its exclusiveness? Are there other examples of culturally specific localized and guarded textile traditions that you know of? Uh, maybe this also links to the diaspora aspect. Um, I think the question is whether we're talking about Jewish exclusiveness or not, but I see Lily, do you want to answer? Well, I'm thinking there is one article. Uh, let's see, I have it. It's called, uh, it's from the Journal of Jewish Art. Um, and it was hard to find. Uh, it's by Giza Frankel, who uh, Elena mentioned earlier. And she, it's called, it, the title of the article is Little Known Handicrafts of Polish, Jew of Polish Jews in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, and I believe she names five. Uh, Total. I mean, and this is across craft. This is handicraft, and you know, like that's that's such an enormous category. Uh, and she could find five. So I, I think that that's sort of a, a representative, specifically of, of this culture. I I would be not surprised at all if this is a common experience among other groups, particularly di diaspora groups. Great. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Sabrina. 
who asks, is it possible to go into some detail of how the results of your attempts to emulate this technique is different from the few pieces uh, we have seen or you have seen? Why isn't it just normal bobbin lace with a heavier material that needs more accuracy due to, due to the memory of wire? Um, okay, I guess I will answer this one too. Uh, it's so the bobbin lace itself, it's like, it's very hard to describe. Uh, wait, can we bring up a, a photo of it again, possibly? Yes, sure. And also we had a few questions if we can go through the photos again, so we can oh. also do that afterwards or at the same time, honestly. Yeah, that's great. Um, let's do it, present. And I will share my screen. And also I will share uh, a link to all the slides later that have the names of where, which museum uh, is it from, which collection, so everyone can view that. This is uh, free to the public to see anyway, so. I, I also will take this opportunity to plug, if you have information. <laughs> yes, contact all <laughs> please, of us. <laughs> please contact us, here's my email. Uh, Y'all can post your emails as well. This is like, I feel like this is the type of forum where there may be someone watching who <laughs> knows. Um, okay, so, so how is it different? Uh, how's my work different than the actual Spanier Arbit technique? So actual Spanier Arbit, uh, what I know so far is that there's a couple cotton threads that are that create a sort of core. And that core is, is secured together by crocheting metal tinsel, which is a, a flat uh, metal fiber. Um, I think that you know they can range in width. Um, I think you know this in Spanier, what I've seen here is you know it's maybe a millimeter or two thick. And those wrap around, secure the core together. Uh, and then simultaneously, there are other cotton fibers that are moving the core and allowing it to, to stick to itself almost. It's like creating a surface area out of a line. Uh, and then also there's this netting involved sometimes, which I think you know kind of strays into other techniques. Um, and bobbin lace in, uh, in Spanier Arbit is different than other bobbin laces, in particular with the wooden jig it's made on. Uh, there are other, you know, bobbin lace is also often done on rotating pillows, but in this case, the, the, <laughs> the string are then attached to, um, uh, you know, like pins at the top of this, this top of this wooden jig, and then they hang down. So the gravity of the, of the um, spindles hanging down, pulling the thread, allows this tension that then makes it easier for the maker to move the wire. Yeah, yeah. And you can see also, I saw somebody commented earlier, which I've never noticed and I think is fascinating, that you can see where the artist's feet are placed on those bottom two left uh, pegs there where they're worn down, uh, which I think is just amazing. So being, you know, that type of material evidence is, uh, I think is so beautiful. but. I'm, you know, I'm trying to show that it's very complicated, the actual technique. So what I'm doing is far more simple. I'm doing like the most basic style of bobbin lace where I take 20 bobbins and I wind them back and forth. Uh, and this is like uh, leagues ahead of that. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah, it's, I feel like it's really quite difficult to explain how it's made specifically, but it is also from another thing that I was reading that I understand it. If bobbin lace, usually you work it basically from top to bottom, like it has um, mm. a vertical progress. This has a horizontal progress. So you're working in a way that doesn't, is very like the opposite direction basically from bobbin lace. So it then 90 degrees to the left, pretty much, um, which I cannot figure out for the life of me, what does that fully mean? But it is just worked with bobbins on a bobbin lace-esque setup, but it is not entirely bobbin lace. It is and it isn't. And I think this is, there were a few questions asking what makes it different than bobbin lace. It's the fact that it's not exactly bobbin lace. By the same time it is. It, it's a derivative. So it, I think it has its origins in bobbin lace, but it's an entirely separate, you know, they're not the same. I mean, we, we reference bobbin lace so that people in the audience can have an understanding and also for us can have an understanding of how it works, that it's close to bobbin lace, but it, in the same way that Yiddish is not German, but um, Spanier Arbit is not bobbin lace. Yeah, that's a really good distinction. And maybe um, also another good reference from the textile world to think about it is perhaps thinking about needle lace 
uh, sometimes we talk about needle lace as embroidery, but it is in fact not embroidery, it is needle lace. It is its own thing that does have a lot of similar techniques, but ultimately it's really its own thing in its own right. Um, we had a few questions of going over the photos again and saying what is which item. Uh, so maybe we'll do this very quickly. And again, apologies for the blurred images. It is very, very hard to find images generally of this. And sometimes you can't publish them because of copyrights, museums, collections that do not want it in any capacity beyond your personal research and use. Um, so this is a photo of an atara. This is from the Yeshiva University Museum's collection. Atara is what you have in the prayer shawl on the talit or talis. Uh, so the things we saw with the men usually that have them on their shoulders. This is another uh, atara, two ataras. This, this piece in particular, I want to say, is my favorite piece that I've seen so far out of all of them. And it's unique because it has the mesh um, in that middle. There's a lot mm -hmm. of empty space, um, which sort of mirrors other many other lace techniques in a way that most Shvener Arbit really does not. It's quite dense. And the use of mesh like just is not seen in any other piece. And so uh, there's some theory, um, according to... Sorry, I don't want to give her name. Um, Bonnie Dara Michaels at Yeshiva University that this is a piece that came later in time, maybe in the 30s. Mm. Uh, and you know, when when the skill was when the techniques were changing a little bit. Um, so I, I really would love to see more about this in particular because it's so different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be really interesting to see um, what year is it actually from because we do have some earlier pieces. And another thing that when I think about the more canonical Shivani Albert pieces, they remind me a bit of gold work embroidery, which is very, very dense and very heavy um, and just in appearance, not in technique. And this really resembles more of the classic look of bottom lace in a way. Um, so it is quite unique in that sense. And by the way, this piece, I think it's on the Israel Museum's website, but this piece and two to four others can be seen at Yeshiva University. They have a gallery. Um, and there's someone there, Bonnie Dara Michaels, who can um, show you the pieces if you ever want to go see. That's, I did not know that. And I will definitely go see very soon. She's also wonderful. I'll put her email in there. She knows a ton. Great. Right? Amazing. Relatively, it to me as well. <laughs> um, then we have, once again, some more uh, atroth. Mind the fact that actually not all these are Spanish. I think specifically the last one is not. Uh, some of it is basically gold work embroidery, uh, but not English gold work in the sense of what you would think about gold work in the, usually it is embroidery with gold and um, gills and threads and all the specific types that I do not know the specific names of, so I'm not going to attempt, but they are bunched together because often you have a combination of different textile techniques with Spanio to create yeah. some items. And these, and, and we should probably end um, after this, uh, but I want to point out here um, something unique with the Spanier Arbit is that you can see there's um, specific designs. And so on the top one, for example, I think that would be the, the Herzle, the heart, um, which was a design typical of Sasov. Um, and then the second one looks like it might be um, Well, you know, a, a rosette, uh, which was just like another of the options. And I, I meant to say this earlier, and I, I didn't. Um, but these symbols on the um, on the atarot used to be used to communicate things. Um, for example, certain communities would select only one type of design. The belt chassidim would would select the capel motif, motif, which is the um, head motif, a shape that was like a head. I, I don't have any images of it. Um, uh, Kamarno Hasids would take the Liske, which were the fish scales, and the Zionists would take the Mug and David. Um, and I think that there were other symbols, but like people would, you, you know, have these representations of the ideology embedded within the materials of their lives. Uh, and it, there's just, it's so rich, like everything about the Shvanian Arbit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great point. Thank you. Um... Yeah, this is an attempt at a close up. You can't really just show the patterns, which you can't see that well. Um, as you can see, it's very, very dense generally, uh, such as this one. And here, where you can see the Magen David, Star of David, for instance. This is one of the um, basically breastplates 
Wuchtis, I will pronounce it badly. I'm sorry, my Yiddish is not amazing, which is for women. Someone in the chat mentioned that it might be for modesty, and it is actually for modesty, but it is not exactly like a religious required attire. It is to hide the buttons of your blouse, so God forbid no one sees anything, but it is not exactly religious in that capacity. Um, you have it as embellishments for uh, the parish hall for a talit or a talis and how it is worn. Um, this one on the right is from Berlin in Germany in 1934 and to the left is from 1860 in Ukraine. Uh, the jig, as we mentioned many, many times. This is more uh, Bustuch, uh, which is again, sorry for my Yiddish pronunciation if anyone here is a Yiddish speaker, uh, which is again the breastkerchief which is a cute name for it. And notice that on the left, the furthest out left is actually not Spania. This is actually embroidery. Um, but the right one in the center one are, and they have beautiful, beautiful patterns and they are sewn on some kind of backing linen or cotton. Uh, the Bolstichel, Bolstuch, many names uh, from an actual photo approximately from the 1900s, like early 1900s, somewhere in Galicia, which is modern day Poland, Ukraine, and maybe uh, potentially, I'm not sure, covered a lot of grounds. And from the National Museum of Krakow that has a few images and they are great. They have a lot of angles as well, which is not common and high resolution. Um, this has a specific name, which I don't remember, but basically this is a head covering for a woman, uh, usually after you get married for the most part. But I think in some cases it was worn beforehand as well. This is all Spania, actually. This obviously you have some ribbons, but basically this is Spania. Um, and these are really, really fascinating because these are actually from the 18th century. So these are earlier than the origin story, the myth uh, that Elena was talking about. Um, here, notice that it's only the band that's a Spania, but it's mostly un unravel and undone. Uh, and the rest is embroidery and other techniques. And the same here, it's embroidery plus spania. And lastly, one of the most classic things is making a yarmulke or a kippah, uh, and it's made in triangles and then stitched together on a base. So that as far as the images go, I will also drop the link to all of these images that have, well, not the links, I can add those later. If, um, I'll manage to put all the links properly, but they have all the, exactly the collections number. So this should be viewable to anyone who has a link. And maybe we'll take one, we're running really over time. So let's see if there's one last burning question. Um, I think actually, or maybe Elena and Lily, if you see a question that you feel like you really want to answer. There's a question about uh, whether they were brought to the U.S. Um, in private collections, not shared in museums. This is this is an interesting point for me. I think uh, when when Pete, when things from Jewish homes uh, were redistributed, sometimes uh, after the war, you know, taken from Nazi households, uh, etc., the original owner or the family would be sought out. Um, and if that person couldn't be found, they were dead, they didn't have any descendants or their descendants weren't interested uh, in taking the items back, then they would be donated to museums. And that's how I, in my understanding, that's how most of the pieces of Spanier Arbit ended up in the museums that have them now, particularly in the US. Uh, but sometimes they are donated directly from private collections to museums. Great, thank you. Um... And I think with this, we're at about 10 minutes over time. So I think this is a good time to um, end this conversation. I had a fantastic time chatting with the both of you. Are there any last words for now that you would like to say? Put your emails, plug any, ask for information, et cetera. This is the time to do it, Elena and Lily. No, the, thank you for having us here. This was so, um, so great to talk about. And I do wanna put a little bit of a plug. Layla just, um, has a has a show that just started. I think it's in Jersey. I would love for you to tell people where it is. I'm dying to go see it. It's phenomenal your work. Um, so, shameless plug for you. Thank you. 
Yes, I do have a, a work that is uh, Ven- based on Venetian bob and lace, so not Spaniel just yet. Okay. Um, but yes, uh, in Mana Contemporary in New Jersey, in Jersey City, if anyone's interested. Um, and I will also put my own email in the chat. If anyone has any information about Spaniel, is interested in talking about it, all of us are nerds and we just want to talk about it further. So I will put my email, please spam me. Um, and if you have any other questions, you're welcome to do so. Lily, do you have um, anything you'd like to plug or anything to add before we part? Nothing. No, this was so wonderful for me. Uh, thank you. I'm so thrilled at how many people came. That means like almost 100 people now know the name Spanier Arbit in the world. Exactly. So that's great. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. A special thank you, obviously, for Elena and Lily for joining me in this conversation. It has been terrific, and I'm super excited that this happened. And I hope that we have many more conversations about Spania with potentially new discoveries. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Thank you.